In this video, we will do the unboxing, setup and usage guide for the Platwatch Type 3 sensor, Keytera Sensage Mini, coming right up! First, the coffee. Before we start, I would like to guide you. This is an unboxing and setup as a sensor. If you want to know how many rewards you can get with it, how it compares to other Planet Watch sensor types, how to buy it, then go watch my Type 3 unveil video, link in the top right corner and in the description below. For onboarding of the sensor on the Planet Watch network, we need to wait for the new app that will be launched at the end of October in order to do so. I will of course do a video on how to do that, so do subscribe. While this video is not about the onboard of the sensor, it will be necessary since we need to set up the sensor, turn it on and link it to the internet, before we will onboard it on the Platwatch. Not only that, but we do need to realize that the Keytera Sensage Mini is highly performant air quality sensor and not a dedicated crypto miner. We don't mine planets, we get them as reward for sending the data that the sensor collects. So after we drink the coffee, let's get down to business. As you can see, Keytera decided to do a design box and not go with a plain one. On the sides there is nothing important, but on the back we get to see the package items, technical specifications, sensor description and contact information, so everything important is there. So let's cut the wrapper foil around and inside we have another box. This one is plain, but it has the Keytera logo nicely embossed. When we open it, we are greeted by the sensor and the two modules, the particulate matter and the VOC one. Keytera ships this sensor with also other modules, but these are the one in the Planet Watch configuration. Next, we have the electric box mounter and the wall one. Underneath, we have something special. A calibration report for our sensor. This is why Planet Watch has no competition right now. It uses the highly performance sensor in order to collect scientific grade data. Next, we have the manual. Besides that, we have a bag to store the VOC module if not used. We will need this bag. We also got a USB to USB-C cable of around 2 meters or 6.5 feet long. We also got screws and wall plugs. And the last item in the package is the power adapter that outputs 2 amps with an incredible amount of adapters. Talking about an international package. So let's see the specifications. The sensor measures temperature, relative humidity, carbon dioxide, PM2.5 and TVOCs. It can connect to internet via either 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi connection or via internet. For power we have three options, through the power adapter and cable provided, USB-C in the bottom of the sensor, or through the ethernet port or direct wire on the back. It has a width of 155 mm or 6.1 inches, a height of 129 mm or 5.1 inches, and a depth of 34 mm or 1.3 inches. It has a weight of 320 grams or 11.3 ounces. It does have an internal fan in order to push the air into it, but it's hardly noticeable. I even left it overnight in the bedroom without a problem. Regarding data, it uses around 1 megabyte per day, so hit that thumbs up button if you like this video so far. Going into the setup, we must first decide if you leave it on a flat surface or mount it with the provided accessories. We can let it on a surface in the vertical position. The main thing here is that the bottom and the top of the sensors are the air ports through which the air is circulated in order to be measured, so they are not to be covered. Step number one is to open the front panel by giving it a firm tug. Here we can see the two placeholders for the modules, an on-off switch, a reset button, a status LED 
and the sensor's identification information. The second step is to power it. Yes, with the front panel opened like this. I'll be using the USB-C option in order to power it. The status LED should start blinking yellow, indicated that we are in the config module for the next 15 minutes. If your unit does not start blinking yellow, repeat the plugin and turning on steps that I just did. Next, we will need to install the modules. The most important part is to place them with the Kaitera logo and the plastic ring facing forward towards us and the pins up. We can place them in which order we like and in what socket we want. And it's not only doable, but highly recommended to install or swap the modules while the sensor is on. We'll start with installing the silver particulate matter module. We should press it until we hear a click. If everything is ok, the LED of the socket should blink once. If it flashes continuously or stays on, the module requires replacement or it has a failure and needs to be looked at. To remove a module, just grab it by the plastic ring and pull it out. Now that we have it on, we need to set up the SenseEdge Mini. To do that, we have two options. We can use a laptop or we can use a phone. I will show you the phone version and talk about any differences between the two methods as I go along. So grabbing the phone, we need to go to App Store for iPhone or Play Store for Android and download the Keytera Enterprise app. Not the live one, the Enterprise one. If you want to use the laptop, you need to go to their support website and download the Keytera Enterprise configuration tool. This is available for all platforms, Mac, Windows, even Linux. The link to this page is, will be in the description below. Once we downloaded the app or install the program, open it. The next step is to connect to the Wi-Fi generated by the SenseEdge Mini. The name will start with Keytera. If you don't see its Wi-Fi, try turning it off and then on and look for the blinking yellow light that indicates the setup mode. Going back to the app or the program, we will tap on configure. If you see any pop-ups about permissions, tap on OK. Once we have a connection with the sensor, we will see a device details view. The important part is to copy the UDID, which is the sensor specific ID. We will use it in a few minutes. Another thing to check is the sensor life, where we can see the module's health. The next step that we need to take is to go to the configuration tab. Here we can set a name for the location of the sensor and the name for it. Once that is done, we need to connect it to the internet. In the interface, we can choose which method should the sensor choose. It makes sense for a manual selection, since there are cases where we want to power the SenseEdge Mini through the Ethernet, but have the internet connection through Wi-Fi. If you use Ethernet for connection and have DCHP, then there's no need for things for you to configure. If you'll use Ethernet and need a static IP, you need to set the mode to be static and then input the IP address. If you want to use Wi-Fi, bear in mind that the sensor only knows the 2.4 GHz connection, so make sure that the router has it enabled if you tinkered with your hotspot settings. By default, it is. In the SSID, we need to put the name of the Wi-Fi and be careful that this is scan sensitive, so write it exactly as you see it in the Wi-Fi list and also the password for it. Another thing to consider is, if you use the phone, it will prompt you that the Wi-Fi connection has no internet access and if you like to switch to the mobile data, tap keep trying Wi-Fi or something similar to stay connected to the sensor. This will appear both on iPhone and on Android devices. Underneath, we need to check this device will be connected to the internet and make sure that the sleep mode and disable configuration mode are both off. Unlike Atmo or Element, we will never reset the TVOC or CO2 levels. These are advanced settings for the service use only. The baseline correction happens automatically over time. The last step is to tap on configuration device in order to send all these configuration settings to the SenseEdge Mini. 
On the sensor itself, it will enter powering mode. So the status LED should flash slowly with the green color. In case of success, the LED will turn off. Otherwise, it will flash red for no connection and it will stay red for device failure. If so, restart the whole process. If successful, we will place the top lid back again by pressing on the corners. Great! The last step is to open a browser and go to dashboard.kterra.com. The link will be in the description below, of course. We need to create an account. Now, once we do and we are logged in, we will tap on Add Device. In the first field, we can set it under a category, here name project, and the most important thing is to paste the UDID that we copied when we connected the sensor in the setup mode. Once we are done, we will see the sensor and we can see detailed readings and the status of it. Bear in mind that we'll probably do a firmware update after it will be connected to the internet and it will take a few minutes until we will see the sensor online. Also, this page is not updated live, so you need to refresh it in order to see the latest data. So, what can we see? The firmware of the sensor, the module's health and the air quality readings. Of course, we have an overall index and then a breakdown by each type of measurement. What I found interesting is that we have a PM10 reading, while nowhere on the box it says that it measured this. So, a nice surprise I think. How can we read the data in order to improve our indoor air quality? First, we will start with the legend. Any number or line in green means the air is ideal in that regard. Yellow means average, orange below average and red means dangerous levels. The overall index is the main thing to monitor as it provides an overview based on all the readings. Next, the carbon dioxide is also important. It tells us how fresh the air is since the main producers of carbon dioxide inside is us when we breathe out. A high level will lead to insomnia, fatigue and for most of us that are working from home it will hinder our ability to focus. So open a window when these levels are high. PM10 and PM2.5 are different sets of dust and other very small particulate matters. The most dangerous one is PM2.5, since they are so small that our natural barriers will not stop them and they will travel directly in our lungs and sometimes end up directly in the blood if they are water soluble. Cleaning the dust, opening windows will help with this. TVOCs refer to chemicals that are released into air by different objects and surfaces in our homes. Watch out for air fresheners as they are not healthy and TVOC will highlight that. If opening the windows frequently to lower the CO2 will not do much for the rest of the readings, consider buying an air purifier. PlantWatch is planning to sell some air purifiers for our benefit, so this is a nice touch from the team. That's it for this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already and stay tuned. Until next time, see ya!